So we all were shocked to see war break out in Israel over the weekend. Mm -hmm. I think it's the last thing I thought was going to happen anytime soon. But here we are. So here to help us better understand it is Dr. Glenn Dewar, Professor of International Studies at Cedarville University. Welcome back, Dr. Dewar. Great to be back. So I know it's a, a kind of a weird ask because it's such a big thing. But in a, as concise manner as possible, could you remind folks of what is this conflict happening in general, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Sure, it's a contestation over land, claims by both Jews and Arabs to have a state in the modern era. If we open our Old Testament, uh, Gaza is an area roughly equivalent to about half of Philistia or the Philistines. Uh, if we think through those lessons, it's a much smaller territory, uh, roughly 140 square miles. So not very large, but some 2.3, pushing 2.5 million people. If we fast forward to the modern era, or at least you know, 100 plus years ago, we have the Ottoman Empire that was over this territory, but then loses the Great War, what we call World War I today. And then it's a British mandate. And there's a promise to create a Jewish homeland. That is delayed and delayed. And then we have World War II, we have the Holocaust, and half the Jewish people brutally murdered by Hitler's regime. We also, at that same time, have thousands of Jews moving back to the Holy Land, and then a recreation of the State of Israel in May of 1948. There was a U.N. partition plan in 1947 that would have fairly evenly divided that land into Palestinian and Israeli states, but that was not accepted by Arabs in the area. We have the first Arab-Israeli conflict in 1948. Israel emerges victorious, and they then do it thereafter on several occasions, 1956, 1967, 1973, in pretty significant wars that then give Israel control of a lot of the territory. The Palestinians are divided into two areas, the West Bank, that is west of the Jordan River, that is the largest settlement, and then there's a much smaller one, the Gaza Strip, down on the border in the southwest with Egypt along the Mediterranean. And in general, relations with Palestinians in the West Bank have been improving. There's a decent amount of cross-border trade working together. Even though we see issues on the news periodically, the wider story is that there's a much more peaceful situation in that area, generally. However, in Gaza, Israel withdrew formally in 2005, and the Palestinians gained formal administrative control in 2007, Hamas designated a terrorist organization by many countries around the world, won the election and have governed it since 2008. And one of the reasons why conflict has restarted in this area is simply there's a standoff. Hamas does not recognize Israel's right to exist, regularly lobs mortars, rockets, missiles into Israel. It's not to say it's without any provocation, but it's to say that it's a non-starter because there's no point of negotiation. This conflict started as a bit of a strange one because there was no direct provocation this time. Usually you can point to something to say, okay, this is why it started, but there's no major reason other than the ongoing Abraham Accords discussion, uh, a Trump-era um, peace agreement that brought normalization of relations with Israel, the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, and Sudan. And so an increasing number of Arab spe Arabic-speaking countries normalizing their relations with Israel that come on historic agreements with Jordan in 1994 and Egypt in 1979. And so that is maybe the point of provocation, so to speak, in terms of the current conflict. And yet, in some respects, it would seem to me the nature of Hamas itself is the cause. As in, I don't think we, we can emphasize clearly enough, right, that they're a terrorist organization that, mm -hmm. that wants to eliminate Israel off the map. Fair? Absolutely. And, and they've been brutal historically. ISIS-like in many ways. Uh, just mm -hmm. terrible atrocities. 
and rightly demarcated as a terrorist organization. It is worth noting a nuance that it is more complex because this is a governing entity. They provide medicine and dental services, social services, welfare, things of that nature. But they have a very, very heinous uh, end game. That is, they usually put their headquarters in the middle of hospitals and mosques and kindergartens and things of that nature, oh. so that when Israel attacks, there are dead children, even though the current HQ of Hamas has been obliterated, it does come with civilian casualties that they then show on television, look, you've killed our children. And that's always deeply, deeply unfortunate, but it is part of the way that Hamas operates. Yeah, and I think this is a hard one for us as Americans to relate to, because there's very few countries in the world, right, where your immediate neighbor wants to vaporize you, and they're like shielding themselves with children. I mean, this is truly unique, isn't it? It's rare, at least. Uh, a lot of countries around the world have border issues. They have issues here and there. I mean, think about you know, just neighbors in a neighborhood. There are always you know, some degree of, of issues, but generally right. they see themselves as neighbors and friends rather than enemies. They can resolve these issues. But in the case of Hamas, it's, it is a rarity in world events to have a, such uh, a position as a non-starter simply to say, look, we, we don't recognize even your right to exist. Therefore, we cannot negotiate with you. And we will side with people. We will accept funds from people that share that. And that's where Iran comes in, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the Quds Force, the militant wings of the Iranian government that they too have been dubbed as terrorist organizations, state sponsors of terrorism. And that's where Hamas receives significant funding, despite a Sunni-Shia divide between the two of them. The shared enemy of Israel is, is the reason why Hamas continues to get funded. And it's just it's a brutal situation. You, like I said in the, the opening, you've got almost two and a half million people living in a very, very short amount of space with a government that doesn't really know how to govern. And there's no decent economic development, despite the fact that there really could be a, a, a vibrant tourism hotel industry in that area. Sure. When I was in Israel, I was frequently told they have the best beaches in all of the Mediterranean. This is a place where you huh. could really grow an amazing tourism industry. And, and think of that statement, the best beaches in all of the Mediterranean, the best, best wow. place to go on a vacation. It is, it's, it's remarkable, and yet Hamas is in charge and nothing gets done in that end. Yeah, I mean, when you're focused on, on murdering your neighbors, I guess that distracts you from setting up good tourism. It is uh, 646 on WCRF Mornings with Brian, our guest, Dr. Glenn Dewar, professor of international studies at Cedarville University. When we come back, where are we in this war in Israel and wh where are we headed? Could it get worse? We'll find out from Dr. Dewar. Grateful to have with us at this time in world history, our good friend, Dr. Glenn Dewar, professor of international studies at Cedarville University, as seeming out of nowhere, we have ourselves in the midst of war in Israel. Now, Dr. Dewar, I'm curious, has Israel made it clear what their objective is in this war? At this time, it's somewhat unclear, because while there are clear objectives, that is, get the hostages back as best unharmed and alive, uh, carrying that out is going to be a challenge. Right now, there's a significant siege of Gaza. The electricity has been cut, and certainly uh, there's a mounting pressure on the Hamas government to um, release some of the hostages. But at the same time, it looks like they, these hostages, numbering somewhere between 100 and 150, are going to be used as political pawns. And so in all likelihood, uh, the Netanyahu government is pushing for some level of invasion, maybe some usage of special ops. But that's, as I noted in the beginning, is going to be challenging just given the logistics. It's 140 square miles, almost two and a half million people. How do you accomplish all of that? It's very, very densely populated. So how do you move tanks through narrow streets? I mean, there are just a lot of very logistical-type issues. Now, reservists 
in the hundreds of thousands have been called up in Israel, have, have begun to mobilize. And so this looks increasingly like some level of major conflict will break out. To give some historical context, we've seen flare-ups between Hamas and Israel before in 2008, 2014, 2021. Uh, so these types of things do flare up from time to time, but they're usually done in about a week to two weeks. This one looks like it could be much, much longer, yeah. and strategically for Israel, just to get their citizens back is going to be one of the key objectives, and to stop Hamas from doing this type of thing again is another. That has been said in the past. Uh, it's been much more difficult to accomplish in reality. Yeah, I, I have to wonder whether they have politically an opportunity just to say, we're done. Gaza, you're over. We're taking over completely, we're annexing this, and we're shutting down the whole system. It's certainly a possibility that's on the table. It will cause consternation throughout the Arab street, and as I noted, it may derail Saudi Arabia entering the Abraham Accords, which would have been a major, major change uh, and would have vastly expanded the normalization process that Israel has had with a number of countries. It really would have been quite remarkable, and it looks like that's the type of thing that may get stifled as a result. But there's only so much that a government can put up with. I mean, uh, right. on, regular, on a regular basis, Hamas or Islamic Jihad or another terrorist organization that operates out of Gaza will fire upon Israeli territory. I mean, imagine us putting up with that in the United States. It's just, it's, it's unfathomable to have this kind of ongoing issue. The other piece to all of it is Egypt. Egypt has historically overseen Gaza, but I don't think President al-Sisi of Egypt has any real interest in, in being in Gaza. And so it's incumbent upon Israel to then make decisions about what to do Annexation would certainly be very, very challenging, and it is typically a faux pas of international norms post-1945. But at the same time, what other options exist? It is, a, right. it is a real challenge without the removal of Hamas, without some form of normal government being in the Gaza Strip to, to help the people and to govern for their good. So I've, I've heard some speculate about the possibility of maybe Iran jumping in or some others. What chances do we have of this escalating to more of a global conflict? It's an outside chance, but it is certainly possible. The United States is sending a carrier strike, strike group, uh, the USS Gerald R. Ford, to the region. It's a show of force and um, a point of connection and solidarity with Israel. But certainly with Iran's strong backing of Hamas, there's definitely the potential to escalate. Um, it, it, it's, it really does depend upon uh, whether Hamas, uh, Hamas's actions, but already they have killed 11 Americans, 10 Britons, many citizens from around the world. I don't see an immediate spark that would um, make this a much broader conflict, but a concern of mine is that there are conflicts in the area, and sometimes there can be a contagion effect. It is worth noting that Syria is still going through 12-plus years of a civil war. There are conflicts on the other side of the Red Sea. Uh, there are um, issues in Armenia and Azerbaijan not far away. Ukraine continues to be in a state of major war. So there's a, there's a lot within a fairly close neighborhood that is problematic. It's also worth noting that Hezbollah fired missiles and rockets into northern Israel from southern Lebanon. So there is the potential of a second front in this conflict immediately. And so there are a lot of very, very dangerous pieces. But at this stage, I still don't see a wider conflagration. I, I, I don't see the spark to that just yet. But it is worth uh, monitoring very, very closely. Well, it's just about 7 o'clock now. Our guest on Mornings with Brian on WCRF has been Dr. Glenn Dewar, Professor of International Studies at Cedarville University. 
As always, we're grateful for his insights and expertise in areas of international conflict and politics. For more information, we'd encourage you to go visit their website. It's cedarville.edu. Again, cedarville.edu. Dr. Dewar, as always, we're grateful for your time. A pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much.